This episode of Not Too Deep is brought to you by our good buddies at Squarespace, who wants you to know you can turn your great idea into a reality with Squarespace. Squarespace makes it easier than ever to launch your passion project, whether you're showcasing your work or selling products of any kind. With beautiful templates and the ability to customize just about anything, you can, yes you, can easily make a beautiful website yourself. And if you do get stuck, Squarespace's 24-7 award-winning customer support is there to help. So head to squarespace.com grace for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code grace to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Not Too Deep with me, your host, Grace Ann Helbig. The first, it is, as always, a very exciting episode here on Not Too Deep. I have my good friend Brad Jenkins with me. Who is Brad Jenkins, you might ask? Thank you for asking. Um, he is the, or former, Associate Director of the Office of Public Engagement at the White House under the Obama administration. Okay, I know that sounds like a lot of words and I could barely speak them eloquently enough and articulate exactly what that is because it's an extremely interesting political office. He's basically a creative, curious, wonderful human being that is super excited about you utilizing your voice in interesting creative ways and also making politics uh, understandable and fundamentally um, exciting for people my age. I consider myself like the dumb generation, not to categorize all of us in that, but I myself am very dumb, but curious. And I'm so excited that he's here. One, to talk about his experience in the White House, which is nuts. And two, to explain like why it's so important for us to use our voice as adults in the world that have this wonderful... Guys, trust me, I speak better in this episode than I do right now. I'm just overwhelmed with information. I'm sure you are too. Enjoy this episode of Not Too Deep with Brad Jenkins. Oh, I'm so excited. Brad Jenkins is here. Grace Elbig. Um, Okay. <laughs> I've been wanting to figure out how to correctly form this opening question to people. And I think you are the perfect guest uh, for me to test this on. So right. I'm, I'm sorry. It. This is a question I hate answering. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, but for people that have no idea who you are, mm -hmm. how do you explain what you do? Oh, man. And this it can like be a as good brief. Question. It, it's very. I mean, I I don't think I would do you service trying to explain what you do yeah. or like what your um, current occupation is. So I, you know, kind of give yeah. it to the professional it's, to do this so. This is the question my parents ask me like every six <laughs> yeah. months. I'm like, what the fuck do you do? Uh huh. So I'm a producer, right? and I think most people don't even know what that is. Mm -hmm. uh, so I help finance projects, mm -hmm. and the work that I do at Funny or Die is political comedy. Right. So the work that I do is I used to work in the Obama White House. Just a quick, um, just, I mean, pick up this name that you dropped. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry. I have to clarify that it's the Obama White House because, Right, because when you say you worked in the White House. There's uh, a new White House now. And lots of people are getting fired, so you could say <laughs> worked in a past exactly. tense at any point now and be associated with that. Me yeah. and the mooch mm -hmm. just hanging out. Um, <laughs> Jenkins and the mooch. Jenkins and the mooch. Uh, buddy cop you, comedy you don't want to see. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I work uh, at Funny or Die. We have a whole team that does mm -hmm. um, partner productions, which is uh, a fancy term for ad campaigns. So right. you do a lot of this branded entertainment work. So we work with corporations, studios, movies, music. Um, the work that I do is for political campaigns. Mm -hmm. So organizations, institutions, foundations, candidates come to Funny or Die, um, and they ask for our help in <laughs> reaching young people, which is very, very hard for political campaigns to do. Hard and completely necessary and important. Completely necessary and important. Yeah. And so... We've done, I've been at Funny or Die now for almost, I guess, three and a half years. We've wow. done like 40 campaigns, which is incredible. That's it's in, very fun. I met you four plus years ago mm -hmm. and I got a blind invite to the White House with yep. my good friend, Mamrie Hart. And it was so overwhelming <laughs> and so cool. And we were so not prepared because we had done a show in D.C. with Hannah and uh, we were so hungover going to the White House. But we were literally like, we have to wake happy. up. Yeah. We have to go. <laughs> we have to iron our clothes. We have to find something that is decent to wear. And we went and we were just literally in this like 
foggy, hungover state, being like, how are we allowed yeah. in here? And then we were bowling all of a sudden. We were bowling. And then we were sitting in Michelle Obama's office. And that then all too. the <laughs> lights went off at one point, And we thought we were under attack. And it was just that the, the lights are on a monitor system. And they turned off because no one had moved in a certain amount of time. And then we had her apples. And we took apples from her office. We had apples. It's it was true. a whole thing. But so you... Uh, I have so many questions. So pardon me if my brain is like firing on all cylinders right now. You, How did you get started working with the Obama administration? I mean, I know you, you I read a little bit in the book, which is like yeah. so exciting. And I have so many questions about the whole chapter between two friends, all of that. But how did you get started in the Obama administration? I, it's a story you hear a lot for Obama staffers. I'd never been involved in politics before. At all. At all. Okay. Like I never even volunteered for a campaign before. Wow. And this guy, Barack Obama, was running for president. Uh -huh. And my wife and I had just moved to California because okay. she was starting law school. And we didn't know anyone. And Obama had announced his candidacy. And we were huge fans because mm -hmm. we're both, my wife and I are both what we call incognito, which is, for those of you who are unfamiliar, we look, we are black, uh -huh. but no one knows that we're black. And so you're Korean also, Yeah, right? my mom's Korean, my dad's black, right, and my yeah. wife's half white, half black. Okay. And we've lived these lives where no one knows we're black. Like, no one knows that that's our story. And sure. so we have this kind of weird identity. And uh, Obama also very similarly had this weird identity. So we love Barack. And yeah. so when he announced, and then there was all these, like, Obama, Camp Obama volunteer trainings, and we were like, fuck it. We don't know anyone in this area. We were yeah. living in San Francisco and we just went. And it was like a bunch of, there are a lot of incognito kids like us. There's a lot of um, moms and there's a lot of teachers. Yeah. Like this cool community of, of people. And we just became super volunteers and we became... We like drank the Kool Aid. Like, I was they gonna say, this is the church I would yeah, subscribe exactly. to. Yeah, <laughs> that really sounds is. amazing. It's the the church of Obama, but yeah. it was all of these kids for the first time believing that Obama could win because yeah. at the time, Hillary Clinton was up by like forty points. Like mm -hmm. no one said Obama could win. Everyone kept telling us we were dumb. Yeah, we were like Barack Obama. And they're like Hillary's gonna win. Like Barack Obama can't win. And so we were like, fuck it. Like we're gonna volunteer we're gonna do everything they tell us to do yeah and we created these my barack obama accounts because there was no facebook it was it was myspace was popular at the time oh right this is like 2007 and just barack photos like from the top down <laughs> exactly. just like full emo style yeah yeah and you'd like create your profile and we had this little house in silicon valley and we would just have these house parties every day uh, not every day but every week uh -huh. and then the group we became the most active volunteer group pretty much in the country. Wow. I mean, it wasn't just my wife and I, but it just kept growing and growing yeah. and growing. And then when the campaign eventually sent staff, everyone kept saying, well, Brad Jenkins is like running this thing. You became like the unofficial leader. I became of the this. unofficial leader of these like Kool-Aid drinking volunteers. Wow. And then when I finally met staff, they're like, well, who are you? Uh -huh. And then I like every answer I gave was wrong because they were like, <laughs> They were like, so what do you do for a living? And I was working at a hedge fund at the time. I was uh -huh. like, I work at a hedge fund. They're like, okay. Uh -huh. And they're like, so where did you grow up? And I was like, oh, Jersey. I just moved here like a couple months ago. <laughs> like everything I said was it seems so the wrong sketchy. answer. Yeah. yeah. It's like, so you work in finance and you just moved here, but you're like running the volunteer operation. Anyway, so, but they didn't care. Yeah. And so, um, Super Tuesday, which was California, came and went. Our little army of volunteers kept making calls to other states. Mm -hmm. And then my childhood friend from Jersey, because mm -hmm. it all goes back to Jersey. It all goes back to Jersey. All about Jersey. <laughs> he was a very senior staffer okay. on the campaign. And he was in Nevada. And we were doing a lot of work together. And they had a job open up in Chicago. And so he called me and was like, hey, Brad, I know you've been volunteering would you like to come to Chicago? And this is after Obama wrapped the nomination uh, to work for the general election. Yeah. And I quit my job. I was like working. Oh. My wife and I just gotten married. We like moved to California. I got chills. I know. And, and I was just like, I guess I'm going to quit my job and move to Chicago. So, um, so it was a very 
like I didn't plan for it. I think that's the other thing with the Obama world that's very different is I think people think, I don't know, that like we got into it to work at the White House or we got into it because we like wanted power or whatever. But like most of the kids like me, we just believed in the guy. We just really believed in this idea and we sort of got pulled along for the ride. Yeah. No, You. it seemed like the way you write about it, that it was intuition in so many regards and also like optimism and just believing in a, a good pure cause yeah believing in someone that had good intentions and like hoping that things could change and happen well the crazy thing i mean it's so crazy to think about now because i talk to younger i go to college campuses and talk to kids now and yeah. they're like obama's old now like i'm old so <laughs> but he ran he ran very much to bring the country together mm-hmm. he ran this idea that there aren't red states or blue states like we can come together as a yeah. country and he had this very unique identity where he saw both sides of every story like yeah. he saw both sides of white and black and immigrant and non-immigrant and um and that was my story my parents are republicans and so he struck a chord with me with this idea that i was just so tired of clinton bush fighting it yeah. was just like Bush, Clinton, Clinton, Bush. Mm -hmm. And so Obama was in a way like Bernie before Bernie was Bernie, right? Like (laughs) this is why I tell all the Bernie kids because he was so aspirational. When people said, why do you support Barack Obama? It was like, you never heard people say like his 10 point plan on climate change or like some people would say his opposition to the Iraq war, but most people would say, because this is a moment, this is like a generational moment. And we young people want, we want to say in what our country looks like and mm-hmm. how our country makes decisions. And so it's so crazy though, because once he became president, it was like the exact opposite happened. Like it yeah. became even more divisive and crazy. It's so nuts to see how intentions get spun. So without control, uh, and it's so hard now looking at clips of our current president and looking back at clips from Obama and seeing just like the complete differentiation of like reason, compassion, empathy, all of these just like basic human skills. Yeah. That aside, we don't get too political. I was here, just going to say, we're not going to get too deep. <laughs> we're not going to get too deep. But we were just talking about because I was so excited when you reached out because you have this new book called yeah. West Wingers, right? Yeah. What's the full log line of it? Full log line is 18 staffers. Mm-hmm. Um, behind the scenes staffer. So some senior staffers, but 18 staffers share their stories of their moment Mm -hmm. working for the president. It's very anecdotal. And it's the most, someone had did the chronicle of like White House memoirs, but it's the most diverse White House memoir in history because all of the people are very similarly to me, never imagined that they would work at the White House. And I think most White House memoirs you know, there's a little bit of, I was in the room. I'm really smart. You know, this I'm, was always in the back of my brain. Exactly. Like I was going to end up here. Totally. At some point. Like yeah. I went to all the right schools and yeah. I did the right thing. Whereas this one is very much, it's very like imposter syndrome. Like every, and then we didn't share our stories with each other. Oh, by you the didn't? Way. No, it, okay. it, we, we just wrote them at least maybe no one, no one shared them with me. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe the other people shared them. But when reading them, it's just there is a through line of everyone feeling such privilege and such an honor that yeah. they're even fucking work like even that you get to walk into the White House, right? Let alone that you get to work at the White House, right? And so I think that again, not to compare it to this White House, but there's this idea of it's the people's house. Like we are just honored to be there, and. Yeah. We're just trying to do good for people. That was really our job day to day. And so each anecdote is about that. And it's also the balance of like personal life. There are a lot of stories of, you know, people going through real shit in their lives while also simultaneously trying to run the country, which is also a challenge. I It's so insane because your chapter is so much like you say, it's so it's spoken so casually about something that is like the highest (laughs) like job level thing security wise that you could ever like get invited to in the entire United States. And okay. I want to talk about, uh, the affordable care act 
it's part of your chapter. Yeah. It was a, a launch that was mislaunched a little bit. And then oh, it was awful. Between two ferns, like Bradley Cooper saved the day. Bradley Cooper, speaking uh, of a star is born. I don't want to. <laughs> hang on. I think you need to start from the beginning. I know. <laughs> That's I a lot of information. I know. Sorry. I don't want to spoil the whole chapter, though, because it's so good to, to read. It's so, so wonderfully like good to read. And I mean, so I think everyone was kind of shocked and amazed when Barack Obama showed up on Between Two Ferns with Zach Galifianakis. That yeah. was something that was very cool yeah, and very cool. exciting. Um, so how you had a huge play in that happening. How did that happen? It was, yeah, it was. So I don't want to get too deep into the ACA, but I'll try to do no worries. You can level. kind of surface level because I want people to read this book and I yeah, want people to read this guys... chapter because it's so I, like it's so interesting Aww, to me. Thanks, yeah. Yeah. Well, if people want to know more about the ACA, they can read the book. But yeah. so we had this this law mm -hmm. and then it passed. And then we at the White House had to go out there and tell people, millions of people, that they now had benefits to this law. Right. It's not unlike other administrations dealt with this with um like seatbelt laws, mm. which was a big deal. Like everyone had to go out and say, there are seatbelt laws, you have to click it or you get a ticket. There's right. like this whole thing. So we had to do this with this White House. And the thing we had to do is drive people to this website, healthcare.gov, yep. which didn't work. Mm -hmm. You guys remember that, which is very embarrassing. There's plenty of um, <laughs> coverage on many comedy plenty news networks, exactly. et cetera. Like Stephen Colbert <laughs> yeah. in front of us. Um, so it didn't work for two months. And so, but up until that moment, our office was in charge of figuring out how do you get, how are we going to get people to go click on this website and right. sign up? And we had all of these ideas, but a lot of the ideas were around people like race, like people who had communities that trusted them. Right. Because when you work at the White House, half the country doesn't trust you. Yep. Like half the country, it does not matter what you say, nope. what you do, no one is going to trust you. You could save a completely um, helpless dog and they'd be like, that dog could have helped itself. <laughs> you didn't need to do that. That dog looks like a Nazi. Yeah, yeah should exactly. should not have helped that dog. Exactly. exactly. Um, so, yeah, so we knew we needed, we needed help, essentially. Mm -hmm. So my job was coming up with plans of how do we work with people who have huge networks and huge influence. And so, you know, the... Everyone said, like, go to Lady, speaking of Bradley Cooper, go to Lady Gaga or go to right. Pharrell or go to these people with huge audiences, which we did. But then when the website didn't work, they're so fucking pissed. Oh, read because... about it. The, the, <laughs> how you describe getting calls from, like, Gaga and Rashida Jones's <laughs> PR teams in the middle of the night while changing your baby's diapers is nuts so and gives sad. me anxiety by association <laughs> just reading it. So please read that. It's so sad. So, yeah, we... The, when we line up all these people to get the word out, didn't work. And then, so we had to rejigger and rethink, what are we going to do to reintroduce the website right. once it worked? And one of the ideas that we had, we had a number of ideas, by the way, it wasn't just Between Two Ferns, but we all love Between Two Ferns. I don't know how and much of your audience are fans. At but that time, that was like the biggest, that was the biggest show, series yeah. that was happening. It yeah. was the most interesting thing happening. And the cool thing about it was... The format worked for yeah. what we were trying to do, which was um, it would have been awkward for Obama to go on like a late night talk show to talk about, like a legit late night talk show. Yeah. The idea that he would go on Zach's show, the whole show is silly and mm -hmm. dumb. And and for him to just get made fun of yeah. for, for a good like six minutes straight oh, it, was great. Yeah. I mean, like it's you don't typically get to see that ever. You don't get to. It know. speaks volumes of him and his character that yeah. he is willing to uh, use comedy as a ticket to like explain things. Totally. It, it's in, I, it blows my mind still that he's like so welcoming of that. We I mean, also in full honesty, like we were desperate. So sure, the, other sure, was, sure, sure. the other part of it was, but trusting, cause that could go either way. It could go either way. That's yeah. true. I mean, there, there was huge risk. There was huge reward. Mm -hmm. The, the, we, the way that I laid it out to senior staff was it's kind of like the way that you guys work. We knew the numbers, like yeah. every between two, two ferns video had millions of views. Yeah. So we were essentially like, look, this is the baseline. And this is with like Michael, Sarah and like, right. You know, these are famous people, but they're not the president of the United States. Right. So we essentially were like, look, regardless, we're going to get incredible traffic. People yeah. are going to learn about this. 
And we trusted, I mean, that was the other thing. Like we really trusted Funny or Die because we trusted, yeah. you know, they had this pedigree of Will Ferrell, Adam McKay, SNL. Mm -hmm. Like they had this pedigree of doing comedy for social good. Yeah. And, you know, the, the back and forth though with Zach Galifianakis and Scott Aukerman was so interesting because they didn't really give a shit about the healthcare.com <laughs> website. Like, oh, really? They really did not. Like, <laughs> All they cared about was we're going to make the funniest fucking video of all time. Like yeah. that's all they cared about. Sure. And as they should. Yeah. And all we cared about was getting people to this website. Right, right, right. So there was this, <laughs> there was this balance of, you know, we really wanted to talk about when I say we, like our senior staff, like wanted to talk about healthcare.gov in the first minute. Right. Like we wanted to just get into it. And they're like, we can't do it that way. You have to slow roll you it. You got to slow roll. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, like. it's it's perfect. The way that he, I rewatched it this morning and the way that he's just like, what do you want to plug? Go ahead. Do your plug. Are you done with your plug? And then it keeps going. It's not at the beginning or end. It's in the middle. It's great. It's like very, it feels natural. It feels natural. Yeah. Right. It feels very organic. So, yeah. so yeah, but, but it, you know, and I, as I write in the book, there was just, um, there are a lot of ways, I think, Mike Farah, who I, Grace knows at, at Funny or Die, he's done these like big projects before. And yeah. he's a guy who just knows how to, a good producer just knows how to like make the project live. Yeah. Like, like you're just going to figure out a way for it not to die. Yeah. And there are a number of ways that it could have just died because, you know, one, I think the back and forth with the creative control, um, we did want to see some of the jokes beforehand. So we had sure. to sort of negotiate that a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then the timing was very quick. Like we had to once with the help of Bradley Cooper, we actually got it signed off on. Like we, they had to move super quick. But you quick have to, to read the around. chapter to see exactly how Bradley <laughs> Cooper affected this deal and managed this deal. Cause it blows my mind. And I still don't know why Bradley Cooper doesn't have social media to this day, but Hey, we all work in different ways. It's amazing. If Bradley Cooper had social media, that conversation would have been five minutes. That conversation would have never developed to it that. It would have never developed. Yeah. yeah. So a quick Bradley Cooper story. Bradley came to the White House, uh, very similar to Grace and Mamrie. We had some time Except to kill. Except he was much better kempt than Grace yes. and Mamrie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was uh, He was with Suki at the time. They, they, he was with the state. Oh, yeah. And we had time to kill before the state dinner. And so we met with Valerie. And we were meeting with a lot of people. We met with J.J. Abrams that day. We met with all these like incredibly amazing people that day and Colbert and all these people. And um, we were asking Bradley for help. We're like, what would you do? We're right. trying to get the word out on Obamacare. Can you help us? And he's like, I'm not on social. I can't help. And we we're like, oh, OK. He's like, but you guys should do between two ferns. And he just kept going on and on. <laughs> Like he was the greatest between two ferns pitch man because he had been on it twice. Right, right, right. And so he's just like, it's so funny. Have you seen it? He's like, Can, do you want me to show? And like Valerie, he's like, do you want me to show? He's like, Valerie's like, I've seen it. Like I'm yeah, familiar yeah. with what it is. And so he actually called Zach in her office, which was incredible, uh, and pitched Zach. And That's and then so he funny. ran around the White House telling everyone that we should do between two ferns. So yeah, I mean, that was his <laughs> grassroots promotion. It really, yeah. he was. He was like told the president. He told senior <laughs> staff. He's like. You got to do between two ferns. God, can Bradley Cooper get any better? <laughs> no, he can't. God bless Bradley oh, Cooper. God. Okay, uh, Brad, we have to take a quick break. When we get back, uh, I want to talk about midterm elections a little yes. bit and like why people aren't informed, should be informed, et cetera. All those lighthearted, fun things <laughs> everyone looks talking not about. Not too deep. We'll be right back with more Not Too Deep. Not, 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 not. Deep. Guys, are you hiring? There are job sites that send you tons of the wrong resumes to sort through and make you wait for the right candidates to apply for your job, but that's not smart. Mm -mm. You know what is smart? If you go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Grace to hire the right person. How ironically coincidental that they are, you know, supporting this episode of Not Too Deep. It is. Such a coincidence. Mm -hmm. ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them for you. It's, it's got powerful matching technology, which scans thousands of resumes, identifies people with the right skills, education, and experience for your job, and actively invites them to apply so you get qualified candidates fast. Yeah, there's no more sorting through the wrong resumes, no more waiting for the right candidates to apply. That's why ZipRecruiter is rated number one by employers in the U.S. This rating comes from hiring sites on Trustpilot with over 1,000 reviews. And right now... 
Our viewers and listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash grace. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash grace. ZipRecruiter.com slash grace. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Not, not too deep. Wow. What's up, Grace? I am hardly shocked that this episode of Not Too Deep <laughs> is sponsored by Squarespace. Yay, they are they are our good buddies. You guys know this by now. And if you're new, welcome to our Squarespace ad read. <laughs> yeah, turn your dream into a reality with our good buddies, Squarespace. We actually love them. Squarespace makes it easier than ever for you to launch your passion project, whether you're thinking to start a new business, showcase your work, publish content, sell products, and more. It is the tool for you. With beautiful templates created by world-class designers and the ability to customize just about anything with a few clicks, you can easily make a beautiful website yourself. Plus, Squarespace's powerful e-commerce functionality lets you sell anything online and analytics help you grow your site in real time. Everything is optimized for mobile right out of the box and there's nothing to patch or upgrade ever. Buying domains is super simple and you'll get the help you need with Squarespace's 24-7 award-winning customer support. Squarespace empowers millions of people from designers to lawyers, artists to gamers, even restaurants and gyms and filmmakers and podcasters such as myself. Oh, you can possibly speak from experience about using this thing that has sponsored our web our podcast. Yes, and let me tell you guys, uh, it's really easy to use and um, you really can make a professional looking website by yourself. Like I was skeptical and then I tried it and I didn't even need the 24 seven award winning customer support. Humble brag. <laughs> so turn your great ideas into something real. Head to squarespace.com slash grace for a free trial. And when you are ready to launch, use the offer code grace, J-R-A-C-E, to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash grace, offer code grace. Okay, we're back. And okay, this is an important episode to me because I want to talk about midterm elections. I have been a human being that has kind of, um, someone has once told me that I Mr. Magoo my way through life, which I think is the most accurate description <laughs> of me. Uh, and so I've been extremely uninformed on um, our government for years and years. And we were talking a little bit before we started this about like why that is. I have a theory that in high school, I think I was so um, overwhelmed by like history, my history class, yeah. that I it, just remembering dates and figures and people and things uh, overwhelmed me so much that I just kind of like pushed out my yeah. brain and let art like come into sure. my brain. Yeah. And so I think now as an adult, like thinking about government and politics and being active and proactive in that world is like conditioned for me to be like, no, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. Just, you know, make your YouTube videos yeah, and do that yeah. sort of thing. And I think there's a lot of people that might feel that way because now as an adult, I feel slightly dumb and uninformed and almost embarrassed to like ask questions mm -hmm. about things. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people are doing a really great job to start explaining things. Billy Eichner, I know you work with, yes. is doing amazing, amazing yes. work of like really trying to break it down for mm -hmm. young people, especially. And so I was excited to have you here to be able to use you as a voice to speak to a lot of the people that watch or listen about why midterm elections are important yeah. and the basic uh, ideas of like how people can vote, which sure. I think still overwhelms people so they don't do it. Yeah. I mean, I was the same way. I grew up in a house. My parents were very conservative mm -hmm. and they had this idea that politics and government was just corrupt. Like it's all corrupt. Yeah. You write about and that like, a little bit that your dad doesn't trust anyone. My dad doesn't it. trust anyone. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, and I also grew up in Trenton where it's actually true. Like all politicians in Trenton are corrupt. So there's some <laughs> evidence-based <laughs> facts yeah. there. But, um, but no, I mean, I think we grew up and in a way you're also taught culturally that you're not supposed to talk about politics. Like there's almost this idea when you're younger that it's not nice to talk about politics or it's yeah. not polite. And then for whatever reason, once people turn 18, you're like, you should vote. And then it's like, well, wait, you told me I shouldn't talk yeah, about it's, politics. It's and then now I'm supposed you. to vote. Yeah. So there, we don't do a good job at, at make, I agree with you, like making it cultural. I think mm -hmm. that's the missing piece because I think um, politics and government really just comes down to people. Right. And it comes down to people making decisions for you. Yeah. And when I, the class that changed the world for me was my senior year, we had to like go to school board meetings and we had to like go like to city council meeting. We had to like go and watch what it looked like. Yeah. And it was so sad because you'd go and there'd be no one there. 
Yeah. It'd be like six school board members and like two people in the audience. And it's like, any questions? And like the two crazy people in town that were there <laughs> are like, I've got a question. And then that would be it. Yeah, yeah. And then those six people are making the decisions, very important decisions for Every. thousands of students, hundreds of teachers, funding decisions, school closures. I mean, really important decisions. And no one is there. No one is paying attention. No one is is invested. And so, especially as a parent now, it's like, I think younger people, um, I get it. Like 12% of young people voted in the last midterms, which 12%? is awful number, 12%. Because I think you're taught, you know, elections every four years. Right. There's very minimal until now dialogue about midterm yes. election mattering. Uh, and so that is, I think, still confusing. Like I understand. Right fundamentally that they matter extraordinarily right now but i can't say that in years past i would have had such an understanding about it yeah and in midterm elections i mean every election is important but midterm elections actually end up becoming way more important than presidential elections really because because here's the thing most laws that you're dealing with are at the state level mm -hmm. right or at the district level and midterm elections everything's on the ballot legislative races, state Senate races, governor's races, Senate races, congressional races. And the reason why I feel like it's more important is because turnout is so low yeah. during midterm elections. So your vote matters much more. Yeah. Right. So, you know, unfortunately, I'm a Democrat, so I can be very open about that. But Democrats get their ass kicked every midterm election. It happened for Obama. Because we fall asleep because young people in We're used particular, to that Amazon Prime Now delivery exactly. service and we can't Amazon Prime our votes exactly. from our homes. Yeah. So we, we sort of we sort of fall asleep. And what ends up happening is the Democratic base, by and large, is a voter base that is younger and more diverse mm -hmm. and they're for equality. Right. They're for equal rights for everyone. Equal rights does not matter who you pray to. Does not matter who you love. Does not matter what you look like, what country you come from, what yeah. language you speak, you should have an equal shot in this country. You shouldn't be discriminated against. Mm -hmm. That's the fundamental, you know, core of the Democratic Party. And so, you know, generally younger and more diverse people vote that way. Yeah. Um, the Republican Party, unfortunately, you know, they, and particularly this party and Trump in particular, um, are really questioning that, questioning whether diversity is our strength. They're questioning... Yeah whether who you pray to makes you somehow different yeah. or um, it, it's it's a very troubling time. But unfortunately, older voters who sort of view the world that way, they always vote. They have one They're activity. They're fucking lining up for voting. The <laughs> only reason they put gas in their car is to go to a polling to station. Vote. Exactly. That's it. And yeah. I think, yeah, they it's a very old school system that that's what they're used to. They're so they used show to up. it. And the other the other reality, whether you're Republican or Democrat or independent, the reality is that 92 percent of incumbents win, which means once you get into office, mm -hmm. you're good. Yeah. You got pretty much a lifetime job. The only threat to that is a whole bunch of new people voting, mm -hmm. right? So when you're in, in office, you're kind of cool with young people not voting. You're kind of cool with voter registration numbers not skyrocketing mm -hmm. and people coming out and voting because that essentially means you may be voted out. Yeah. So if once you're in, it's there's not as much of a... Um, you know, it's a vicious cycle of politicians wanting young people not to care right. in a way. And I know it sounds very <laughs> pessimistic, but I mean, even on the Democratic side, Joe Crowley, who was beaten by Alexandria Castillo Cortez, uh -huh. he recently just said, he's like, I lost because of millennials, as if that's a bad yeah. thing. Right, right, right. He right. was like, I lost because millennials got fired up and voted. So I think that, you know, midterms matter more, particularly this election, yeah. because. Two two big facts. One, millennials are now the largest eligible voting block, which Humble is brag. crazy um, because we think that we don't have power. We're like this sleeping giant. Yeah. If we actually we're fucking very, voted. Yeah, we're very sleepy. <laughs> we're very sleepy. <laughs> and if we just got up and did something. If we just got up and voted, the country would fundamentally change. Yeah. Right. And so um, and it doesn't matter what issue you care about. I think. Just the act of going out and voting is such a big deal. Yeah. And then the second thing is, you know, the people, you know, 
again, uh, you may have Trump voters and who may be offended by this, but I have a lot of friends, particularly in LA, who get very angry at Trump voters and they get very angry. Like my parents are Trump voters. Yeah. My dad's black and he voted for Trump, right? Wow. So, you know, you can vote for who you want to vote for. Trump won because the largest population of people on election day were non-voters. Mm -hmm. That was the largest segment of the population. Yeah. People just didn't vote. I have, yeah, I have friends that didn't vote and I shame them for it. Yeah. And they say they'll never, ever do that again. I hope right. that, you know, actions speak louder than words that, yeah, that they don't ever do that again. And I think it's, we're seeing, we're seeing the results of the Women's March. We're seeing the results of people waking up and realizing like, what the fuck did we just, have? how yeah. do we have a reality show host as a president who's calling people horse face, right? Yeah. Like how do, how do we let this Not happen? Calling it, tweeting it, tweeting putting it, it into like <laughs> permanent, like internet language, like not even just saying it one off. Like it's just, yep. We will uh, read about in history books. Yeah. It's in the library of Congress. So yeah. So I think people have woken up and voter turnout is up. During primaries, we're seeing it. Like young people are voting at, at much higher numbers. That's great. Yeah. But I it's saw, not even close to where we need it to be. I mean, Taylor Swift kind of like broke her quote unquote silence God on bless. speaking yeah. politically. And I think she did an amazing job of not just saying vaguely go vote, like yeah. instead gave very specific details on things that matter to her right. and the reasons that she's voting without pushing her agenda, just saying, this is why I'm doing it. I encourage you to inform yourself. And then voter registration skyrocketed. Skyrocketed like crazy. Like broke the record for vote.org. And then Trump said he likes her music 20% less or some <laughs> bullshit like that. Idiot. Uh, and so <laughs> That's I, like the nicest insult he's ever given, by the way. He's I like, I like her 20% less. Uh, like, what really? if? Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I think people like that, that appeal to uh, that kind of like younger generation that realize like, oh, these kind of shiny, happy, you know, uh, celebrities actually have opinions yeah. and not that they're pushing a specific agenda, but they're just telling me to like figure it out for myself is so important. I'm it only is. learning that now as a 33 year old. Yeah. And I wish I had more of this kind of information at my fingertips when I was 18. Totally. Well, we need it. And I think again, not to, I mean, part of the reason why we invited Grace and Mamrie and Hannah and Tyler to, by the way, we invited Grace to the first meeting with the president, but you were, you didn't come. You were like busy. I was too scared. You're too scared. I was so scared. Oh, really? Yeah. Cause I, I got, think your manager made up an excuse. I no, think he was I like, I literally <laughs> got the email and I was sitting in a cabin in LA with like oh my, my ex-boyfriend and I read it out loud and I was like, I don't get political on my channel. I'm so nerd. I don't oh, even wow. know what I would do that. Yeah. I was invited, I think with Hannah and with Tyler Hannah and, and Tyler, everyone. Yeah. And I, I passed on it cause I was just like so overwhelmed wow. by it. Also because I was so uninformed about politics at that time you that I didn't even know what to do. You like would have loved that meeting though. I would have. No, I yeah, trust me. I so great. I watched Hannah's like fervor mm -hmm. before and after and like watched the videos and everything. And I, I felt like I fully missed an opportunity and, I think I was literally the same reason I'm asking these questions was just like sitting in this ball of fear yeah. of not knowing what to do with that opportunity because right. I felt overwhelmed by politics at sure. that time. And I felt like I didn't know exactly how to use my platform to be able to speak or you funnel whatever I was going to get from that meeting into something that made sense. Yeah. Uh, which is why I respect Taylor for like when she put something out, it was completely informed, completely like, personal and specific yeah. without being overwhelming. And I just, at that point for myself, did not know how to like handle that kind of situation. It's a lot. I mean, it's a lot, particularly for you guys, the way that I, I view, and I, I think I talked to you and Chester about it, like yeah. this idea of community, like you guys build communities. Right. And that's a fundamentally what, in my opinion, we need in our politics right now. Mm -hmm. We, we, all of our institutions have so degraded. Like no one trusts anything anymore. Right. We don't trust the media. Right. We don't trust the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. We just we don't trust anything. And I think that that was a conversation in the room with the president was one. It was amazing because he like knew every well, maybe he lied a little bit, but he 
I think he did know because of Sasha and Malia. I think he did know definitely a lot of the people in the he, room. No, and I heard that they were like, he addressed us like by our name. Yeah. And they're like, I don't care if he was briefed five seconds before right. he walked in that room. It was enough for yeah, us to be like, great. oh my God, this man. Yeah. But he, because he's a dad and because his daughters were at that age yeah. where they trusted Hannah and they trusted Tyler right. and you. He was so into the meeting and it was so funny because so it's in the Roosevelt room and we had like senior staff behind him, like our communication staff. Yeah. And it was an hour and a half meeting and he essentially was just like shitting on what we do every day. Like yeah. He was, he was shitting on like well, how heard... everything we do is so antiquated and uh-huh. no one cares about press I, releases. Yeah. And... I also heard that Hannah got a little excited and like dominated 90% of the meeting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that afterwards and I was like, yep, I can totally see that happening. That she was like, this is my opportunity for all good reasons. Like, so great. I care about this. I, I want to see change. I get to talk to a person that has direct yeah. control of that. And this might be my only opportunity opportunity to ever do that she fucking owned it I, that's what we I also heard. teed it up to her though yeah. because we briefed him and we had her like we, we i did the seating chart we had her literally right in front uh, of the president she and like tyler like goddamn <laughs> mind about it yeah it was so insane I, I heard everything afterwards and i i did feel like i missed out but i was still like excited that um people like us like quote yeah. unquote were getting um seats at the table yeah. in so many words, like getting uh, the privilege to be able to have these conversations uh, because we're still learning our own influence and right. we're still learning our own platform and we're still learning the right and wrong ways to speak about well, things that we care we, about. That's essentially in the meeting, I think, at least from my perspective. And I we, we grabbed lunch afterwards and we were talking like Hannah yeah. and Tyler. They're amazing. Tyler turned to Hannah and was like, I think we leveled up. <laughs> Which is like the greatest. I wish I like recorded that because it was like this yeah. greatest, greatest moment. But um, it's true. we had lunch and they were they were so empowered because yeah. the president, and all of us were saying like cumulatively around the room, mm-hmm. there was more power because organizations that we work with come to the White House every day and they're like, we have X number of people that we can reach and X number of people that we can activate and X, Y or Z. But it's not really true. I mean, a lot of these organizations they're old. They're faceless. Too. They're faceless. Yeah. They, they they don't have, um, you know, maybe people will donate a dollar here or there, but really activating people to care about something or to volunteer or to mm-hmm. do something is so very different yeah. than, you know, signing up on an email list. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's what the president and everyone said that essentially we wanted to learn from you guys. And we also wanted to figure out a way where the issues that you guys cared about, like how can we sort of coordinate? But the biggest lesson, which I think was the Empower thing, was like, you don't need us. Like, in fact, it's probably better for you not to work with the White House because then it doesn't seem like you're being influenced or it doesn't seem like- We're doing a brand deal with government, guys. (laughs) Sponsored by government. (laughs) Sponsored by the government, yeah. (laughs) So it was so cool because I think, and- from the meeting, I think, you know, depending on who was there, because there are people there who didn't do anything like right. Visa. I mean, there are people there who are just kind of like, this was cool, but didn't become politically active. Sure. But I think that the people who were there who were moved really have, and I, you see it with Tyler and Hannah, like they've stepped up in such a huge way and they, yeah, in their own way. Years later, they are so still empowered and yeah. still, I mean, fighting for rights and people and things that they believe in yeah. and are speaking out about it now, which is like... More important, like you said, than ever to get out now and figure out, like, what do you stand for? What do you believe in? Voting. I mean, I've heard the phrase like voting is a right. Voting is a privilege for so long. And it never really resonated with me until this previous election when people said they didn't do it. And I I was so... I don't know, just like hit me all of a sudden that I'm like, no, you're allowed to do this thing that so many people aren't allowed to do. I know. And the, the, the other thing that infuriates me, too, is... The amount of effort, and again, I'm getting a little too deep, but the Welcome amount of to the new era of not too deep. It's that time. 2018. Getting too political. <laughs> but there are so many powers that be that are trying to keep you from voting. Yeah. They don't want you to vote. They're gonna they're making it as hard as possible for you to vote. Oh, I you know, went, and it's 
So I've done absentee ballot forever mm-hmm. because right. I'm from Jersey. And for the very first time in the previous election a couple months ago, uh, I went to an actual polling place. It was the first time. I'm 33 years old. Yes. It's the first time I showed That's up great. in person. <laughs> I was so excited to get my goddamn sticker I that said sticker. I voted. Yeah. And so I was like, you have to do I had a, like a full shoot day. And I was like, the polling place closes in an hour. Go. Just go. <laughs> even though you're scared, you don't know how it works, yeah. et cetera. And then I like went upside like logged in, whatever. That's my internet speak for signed <laughs> in to vote. And then they gave me my ballot and I went to this incredibly complicated machine. That Very complicated. I, it was like I learned your fellow New Jersey and so you didn't have to pump your own gas growing up. The yeah. first time I learned to pump my Still own gas- do was very overwhelming. <laughs> and so I felt like I was learning to pump my own gas for the first time again. I was so embarrassed that I could not figure out how this machine worked. But I still like sat there and was like, you're going to figure this out. Yeah. And I was like, why did they make this so incredibly complicated? It does not need to be so complicated. Yeah. I I'm know. like, put a polling station at a 7-Eleven, yeah. make it available through Twitter, and you're right. going to get so many millennials voting. It'll be crazy. Well, it should be automatic voter registration. Some states are doing it now. Where you turn 18, you should be automatically registered to vote. I it's checked, ridiculous. I checked my voter registration a month ago because I saw everyone going nuts about it online yeah. being like, just check. And I was like, yeah. I guess I'll check. I wasn't registered. Yeah? It, like, Did I don't you know- move or was it? No, I have no I literally had voted like a few weeks prior. Oh my God. And I wasn't registered. So I went on like vote.gov or vote.org, yeah, whatever it was. Registered. And I had to re-register. It took two seconds, but I was so thankful that I actually yeah. checked. The the problem is, I think, one, I think we have to start talking about community and citizenship and civics earlier. Yeah. Right? I think, and I think you're right. I think we need to use the arts to do it. And I think that the cool thing about Taylor Swift and John Legend and all these artists is they're doing it in a way, to your point, like they're not telling you who to vote for. They're just expressing who they care about and like what matters to them. And yeah. it makes younger people start to think, oh, what matters to me? Yeah. Because a lot of these decisions, the other the other rant I'll have is, you know, Trump has already put two Supreme Court justices uh, on the Supreme Court yeah. in two years. Um, my kids are going to have these guys, right? I mean, this is the, these decisions. They're a lot bigger than just four years. These are like life long decisions. And so the quicker that we can start getting younger people understanding that, that like climate change is a fucking threat. Like we can't wait another four years to do shit. But we only have like 12 years left. We only have 12 years left. Yeah. Exactly. So I think that that's, I think that's the big thing is, is just making it feel like, um, one that although it's complicated, you can figure it out yeah. and state by state. So you know, in a state like Wisconsin, you can actually register and vote on the same day. Like, oh, literally, amazing. like you can, you don't even have to, there's no re- voter registration deadlines. You can just go what? register and vote. It's like a full drive through. It's great. Yeah. And in states like Colorado, it's something like 90% of the state does vote by mail. There aren't even polling locations. It's just you vote by mail. So there are states where we can make it easy if we want to. Yeah. Again, I think it just comes down to, Unfortunately, powers that be, Republicans and Democrats, there is a lot of um, there's a lot of power in not changing in not changing these laws. And so if we elect if younger people this cycle get in there, get Mm -hmm. fired up, go vote. We can make this shit a lot easier. It should be as easy as voting online. Like it, it should, should be. Also, the amount of things, this is what I, to anyone, well, November 6th are the midterm elections. Just want to put this out there. Yes. Because this episode will come out before then. Thank so, God. Yes. Thank you for that. Of course. No, that's why this is so important. <laughs> yeah. So make sure you get out on November 6th and vote. And I will not take that you don't know how to do it as a response because the right. amount of things that we Google how to do, what is this, totally. what, uh, what does this mean on a daily basis that you can't Google, how do I vote in my midterm elections in the state of blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Like, look through your Google search history at all the insane mundane shit that you've Googled previously and actually look up something that affects you and the world at large. Um, on that fired up, rare Grace Helbig <laughs> political rant, I I'm not too deep. We got to do a cut down to that, by the way. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. <laughs> and when we get back, thank God we're going to talk about shit stories. <laughs> we'll be right back with more Not Too Deep. Not Too 
Deep. This episode of Not Too Deep is brought to you by FabFitFun. If you love discovering new products, if you're always on the hunt for the next best thing, then you've got to try FabFitFun. They are a seasonal subscription box with full-size fashion, beauty, home, fitness, and wellness products delivered four times a year for just $49.99 a box. It's great for discovering new brands and products that you can actually use because everything is full size. No more paying for samples. FabFitFun is a fantastic value. Many products. Individual value is more than the entire cost of the whole box. FabFitFun is a great gift to get yourself and makes a great gift for a loved one. And I can say with full and utmost confidence that this box is fantastic. Like I said, it's actual full size samples of products that you might not have discovered on your own so why not give it a try sign up for fab fit fun today fab fit fun boxes are amazing and always sell out so use my code grace jerry to get ten dollars off your first box go to fabfitfun.com to sign up and start getting the box for a life well lived use promo code grace for ten dollars off your first box that's over two hundred dollars for 39.99 fabfitfun.com use code grace get ten dollars off your first fab fit fun box not, not too deep. Support for today's show comes from Crave, K-R-A-V-E. It is a jerky company, and they've supported us before, and I'm so thankful. Yeah, and they make delicious jerky made with tender gourmet cuts of meat and elevated yet simple ingredients. Crave jerky is a great source of protein that's low in fat, gluten-free, contains all natural ingredients, and is delicious. It truly is. They have a range of flavors that is, as you could put it bold and imaginative from sweet and tangy to savory and spicy i like the sweet chipotle beef but honestly this is i'm a chip girl my whole life and this is basically just like meat chips that you can reach for (laughs) in the pantry it's really great so honestly you really can't go wrong with any of the flavors they've got a bunch of really cool ones including lemon garlic turkey and garlic chili pepper beef they sound crazy but give them a try because you would be yeah uh, Truly delighted. My favorite is the chili lime beef. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, if you guys want to try it out, you can uh, any of their bold and tender flavors, such as chili lime beef or black cherry barbecue pork, oh. for instance, by going to cravejerky.com. That's crave with a K. And you'll get 20% off when you use the offer code GRACE. That's cravejerky.com, our offer code GRACE. Okay, Brad, we're back. Um, we're back. Just to get a little levity here, we're going to ask you to two, the two questions I ask every single guest that's yeah. on the podcast. And the first is, who, alive or dead, would you most like to throw cold spaghetti at? Ooh, there's so many options these days. <laughs> <laughs> and you're our most politically minded guest. And usually all of our comedy guests go political here in this question. <laughs> that don't feel the need to be political in this world well, at all. Well, that's the thing I've been talking about, you know. Um, I... I was going to say Kanye, but I actually feel bad for Kanye. I don't know if you guys have been talking about Kanye, but I'm actually thinking about it and I almost feel bad for him at this point. I read a very, very, Hank Green retweeted this BuzzFeed yeah. article that I thought was very articulate about why it makes sense that Kanye supports Donald Trump. Sure. Um, go through my Twitter if you guys want to go back and, yeah. and see that article. It's on BuzzFeed. It, it was really fascinating and just kind of brought more of a... Um, uh, a full picture to what oh, Trump represents these kind of outsiders that care about that yeah. have always been outsiders and consider themselves like outside like the normal realm of what people support and so they all come together and yeah. support and each other. And that is Kanye. He's like the ultimate outsider. Yeah. yeah. But I also think he would, you know, that would be his next music video. Could totally. be Cold Spaghetti Showers. Cold Spaghetti. I'm going to go with um I'm going to go with Donald Trump Jr. Oh. Because yeah. fuck that guy. Man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. Like, All right. And, there is our uh, yeah. sound bite for the whole episode. <laughs> and, and and even if you like Trump, I mean, you can't like Donald Trump that Jr. Is like, just he's, a, the f- he's just like, he's mean. <laughs> yeah. He's rude. He's aggressive. He's just like he's not so a, full of himself. And he's, he's it's just why? There's you no know? <laughs> decency. Well, because no he had, he's never had consequences his entire life. Yeah. Same said for his father. Um, OK, so <laughs> the other question I ask every guest on the podcast is to tell us your worst pants shitting story or close call. Mm-hmm. But you can only use three words or three small phrases or some combo. So mine is college jogging front lawn. Well, I am a fan of Not Too Deep. I've heard many episodes <laughs> and I'm always so fascinated by people who don't have a story thank you right? thank you i feel like they're either lying 
Or I guess they just really, live well. I was I don't just going to say they eat well or yeah, something. They don't something. drink. Um, so mine is, I have a number, but the one <laughs> that's the least embarrassing is uh, India. Okay. How do I, how do I describe this? <laughs> Great place to I'm start. already fascinated. You got me. India escaping a cab. Okay. City Street. Oh. Yeah, I'm gonna leave it at that. It was, yeah. If anyone has ever traveled, I was with and I escaping a cab with your boss. I was with Mike Fair at the time. Oh my God. And he escaping a cab because it was so before we went uh-huh. i spoke to friends who would like traveled i like not to name drop but cal penn yeah. reached out to cal because he had traveled with the president of india and mike and i were going for the state department uh-huh. cultural mission and cal was like drink bottled water right and don't eat street food essentially oh, no. because you're because the it, everything is just cooked differently the water is sure. not that sanitary and I thought I did that. I thought Mike and I did that the whole time. But Mike got back and he literally was out for like two weeks. Like he couldn't even go to the Emmys, I think. Like he think oh he won my- Emmy Awards. He couldn't go. <laughs> I like ruined Mike Farah. Oh, yeah. You guys were nominated, right? Yeah. Mike like was uh. destroyed. And for me, I was fine the whole time. But as we we're going to the airport, like it just hit me. Oh, no. And it was like cold sweats. Oh, no. And it was like, it's coming. Oh, no. And on so, the way to the airport. On the way to the airport. Oh. And so I call, I told our tap cab driver, pull over. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. And, you know, India. I'm, it was um, <laughs> international politics, some might say. Uh, okay, we're going to get into some Twitter questions All for right. your internet questions at large. Um, someone wants to know, what is your advice for someone who wants to work in government and politics? Like, what's the main... I know you, yeah. have, you have a full TED Talk online that's very cool. I um, do. That gives some, like, kind of just, like, it seems like life advice, but I think some of those might apply to this. Like, what's your biggest kind of lesson for someone that wants to get involved? It's so easy is Mm -hmm. the other thing. I think that um, what I would recommend, depending on where you live or how old you are, is look up a candidate. Well, it's hard now because it's like right before election day. Sure. But traditionally speaking, there's elections every year. There's elections for school board. There's elections for aldermen, city council. Someone is running for office. Yeah. Look up who's running for office in your area and go to their website and volunteer. Just go to their campaign office. Mm -hmm. You'll be surprised. You will end up running the campaign by the end. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) look at the Brett Jenkins story is that he became the unofficial leader of the San Francisco Obama group. Um, Also, I heard Tyler Oakley mention this on his podcast a couple weeks ago that I thought was a really interesting way. If there are organizations that you believe in, Mm -hmm. they usually support or back certain political candidates. And so you can research like through that way and get kind of knowledge about someone that you might not have known about before. Yeah, I think the, the coolest thing you'll find is not to sound cheesy or sappy is um. If you get involved, it's incredible how much power you can have because very few people, particularly younger people, during the Obama campaign, the high school students for Barack Obama all ended up working at the White House. Wow. They literally all did because they were, they saw it all at such a young age and they saw how all the sausage was made that by the time they like went to college, they were fucking like Scott. They were like yeah. PhDs on how to how campaigns are run. Yeah, because you can't learn about that in school. You, you have can't. to be involved in the actual like grassroots of it all. And it does not require. And Grace, you're very self deprecating, but you are brilliant. You're so smart. But people, but politics makes people think that they're dumb. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Like they make it feel like you need to know everything about tax policy or right. earn income tax credits, or you need to know about you know. I don't know, non-discretionary defense budgets. When and in reality, of, you don't need to know any of those things. Every single word you just said makes my inner <laughs> like dumb child that's insecure about right. seeming smart go, ah, exactly. and I avoid, 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 right. instead of just allowing yourself. I think the cool thing too, which is what I found when I first started YouTube, is the community that it builds. Mm-hmm. That you said when you were in San Francisco with your wife that like you found a like-minded group of people yeah. that were all kind of rooting for the same thing. And that in itself is hugely powerful it became more obama almost became like an avatar like it it, yeah we we really just liked hanging out with each other and the community that we were building and so yeah Yeah. it's not hard go find a campaign and especially if it's before election day oh this is a great plug yeah 
this is coming out before election day. There are so many campaigns that you can go and volunteer for. And yes. there's a number of organizations that are doing all these great get out the vote efforts. The one that I am a part of is called Glam Up the Midterms with Billy Eichner. I saw that. Who's amazing. <laughs> yes. And we're going all over the country. We're going this weekend. We're going to Vegas and Detroit. And you can only get into the show if you register the vote. That's right. right. We're yeah. literally bribing. We're literally bribing this people. Is this the, is oh, where we're the best at. Best way people. to bribe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean we're we're making it. We're making free fun shows. But you have to commit to vote or register to vote That's to great. attend. And so. Um, so yeah, come to a glam up the midterms event. There's a lot, and it's not just us. A lot of campaigns are doing this. So that's awesome. Okay. Someone wants to know, did you ever ask weird questions to Obama? <laughs> uh, I know that you had the opportunity to brief him on all of the stats post the between two ferns video, yeah. which must've been extraordinarily overwhelming to say that his comedy video has done well for the United States. I know. And I went in there thinking this was going to be like my Shakespearean soliloquy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, this is my like West Wing moment. Yeah. Like the camera's going to zoom in and it's going to be like, and he was just like, oh yeah, cool. You know, like <laughs> it's, it's another, a comedy video. It's, yeah. a, yeah. it's, it's one minute it's out like of his least, day. Of, it's like the least important thing he did like yeah. all year, you know? <laughs> and I was like, this is my moment to shine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. We... Uh, it was kind of fun. We briefed, we did a lot of meetings with artists and, um, we briefed, we had Adam Scott. I'm a huge Adam Scott oh, fan. Yeah, yeah. And I've gotten to know Adam through Funny or Die and his wife, Naomi, and they're so cool. And Adam, they had this idea of doing a stepbrothers sketch for, for healthcare.gov. Uh -huh. And it's, it's still on Funny or Die. It's really, really funny. Okay. So we like put it in the memo and I remember briefing the president. He's like, Oh, I love stepbrothers. <laughs> I miss him Obama even more. Obama loves stepbrothers. God, like, it makes him miss like him even more. He's like the coolest president of oh, all time. He's the coolest. <laughs> well, I was gonna. One of my questions for you was like, when you were in the White House, do you have a standout like most fever dream moment? I know that like shooting between yeah, friends was probably was cool. insane and intense. But was there any other? I mean, it just must be insane what you see on a re it's regular crazy. basis. Yeah. Um. It depends. I mean, there were. It like went. Working at the White House is just crazy yeah. because every day, every day you're meeting someone, it's their greatest day of their life. Yeah. Like we, we, a lot of our job was just lifting people up yeah. and, and telling their story. And so whether it's like a teacher or a nurse or so every day you're crying because it's someone, come, you know, like <laughs> yeah. it's, they you're, get to come to the White House oh, and yeah. like we're honoring them. And, and so th every one of those moments is so amazing because yeah. Particularly people, I would say particularly people who are older, like in their 70s or 80s and would have never imagined that they would get to be at the White House. So much. And yeah. it means so much. And especially, I would say, communities that like never get invited to the White House, you know, yeah. like African-American, Korean, Sikhs, Muslims. It's just, it was such a special time. We We also sort of I think we even knew that it was like we're probably not going to get this chance again. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We really got to get the most of this. Yeah. So so that was cool. And then, of course, there's like the stories of like crazy celebrities. And you're just like how, like Rihanna, like we hung out with Rihanna <laughs> for like 12 hours for some reason. <laughs> she had like 15 people in her entourage. It was very bizarre. Uh, so That's very, I mean... What a great log line. We hung out with Rihanna for 12 hours for some reason. <laughs> I don't know. Um, that's so funny. Yeah, I saw the uh, Cleveland Browns uh, documentary the, about like the 85 team. That, oh, like, Chicago Bears. Oh, Chicago Bears. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, sorry. I'm getting um, the ESPN documentary series uh mixed up but yeah that they got invited by obama i watched the documentary on a plane and there they was were a documentary just, yeah i didn't know that yeah that he invited them to the i know White i met them all yeah uh, yeah it was incredible there's a documentary out about wow. it and it's like they were so overwhelmed with joy to be invited and it was just like oh like crying about these men that yeah have been through ten thousand basic car accidents in their athletic career it's great like, and they didn't get invited because it was pulled down because of yeah. the challenger spacecraft tragedy yeah and then they just never rescheduled it yeah and so it's insane to see like how much it meant to them and a lot of them yeah. talking about like got invited with an african-american president yeah. like how much more meaningful it was 
then. Totally. Oh, it was just like so very sweet. Okay, here's a very specific. Someone <laughs> tweeted a very New Jersey question yes, for you. Yes, Jersey. Taylor ham or pork roll? Oh, pork roll. Oh, okay. It's not even like a... Not even a question. Not even a, what, how about you? Because you grew up in North Jersey, correct? South Jersey. Or South Jersey. Near Philadelphia. So for so, you, it's Taylor. No, for you, it's pork roll. It's pork roll, yeah. but also scrapple. Scrapple as yeah, well. Yeah, my grandfather sure. made a scrapple all the time, and he lived by the Jersey Shore my whole life. So that's mine. Jack, what's yours? Oh, I love scrapple. But, Scrapples, yeah. Uh, yeah, pork roll. Pork roll? It's yeah. pork roll. It's, Taylor Hammer, the North Jersey people. Yes. Oh, like yeah. my wife's family are all North Jersey people. Okay. It's like, they're all they're the worst. Ham. Yeah, they're Taylor Ham. How do you describe the difference between the two? Taylor Ham and pork roll. I don't think there is. <laughs> but I mean, like, how do you describe the difference between the food items, Taylor ham and pork roll? I don't think there is a difference. I think it's just the way what it's we what call it. It's what you call it. it. Okay. I think it's just what we call it. For people that don't know, it's how do you describe spam. pork roll? It's essentially spam, right? It's just fried spam. Like, it's just <laughs> exactly. in a like a cast iron skillet that yeah. you cook it up. It basically, it just absorbs your full hangover. That's what yes. this food does. Grapple does that, too. No, that's what I mean. All of these all of items all of these are Jersey just food like, items. Yeah. they're just meat scraps that's like... Soak up all of the sin you put in your body the night before. <laughs> uh, someone's no ever invite someone to the White House that wasn't allowed in. Are you even oh, allowed to say that? That's a really that's an interesting question. The, well, the, I know that you talk a lot about like the security measures going yeah. into the White House. Obviously, are yeah. very very in depth, and the system that they have doesn't seem like super efficient all the time. So, yeah, I, I can imagine that there might have been some complications. There have been. I mean, there it's both. There are some people that either send in their information incorrectly or um, not at all. Right. And what ends up happening is, especially for big events, they then have to get reprocessed. And so sometimes oh. that can take a really long time. Right. Because it's a very quick, from my understanding, very quick background check to make sure that there are no arrests out for warrant, you know, warrants out for arrest, excuse me. Yeah. Or um, I don't know, like criminal conviction. They do a random yeah. assortment of checks. And so we have had people come for like Christmas party. It's like it's the worst. Like Christmas parties or like big events, they're like in their gowns. Yeah. Oh no, I've seen like this on Real Housewives of DC. They can't get into the White House. Yeah. So that sucks. But no, we have had people who we just couldn't let in because like they're not allowed in. Yeah. Um, that's happened a number of times. It's a bad, I mean, I think I have a tighter security system at my house. People aren't allowed in. <laughs> they just aren't allowed in. Um, okay. Oh, someone tweeted about YouTube not working last night. It was also terrible. Um, so, okay. This is the last question. Ask if he knows how we can get Obama back. Oh, man. <laughs> I know. That hurts my soul. I know. But I think, okay, I'm going to kind of answer this for you a little yeah. bit. I think the best way we can get the Obama feelings back is by going out and voting. Yes. Like, not to, like, just make this, well, I am making this a very heavy-handed episode <laughs> about midterm elections and your right to vote and utilizing that. I think we all feel the pain of a very wonderful, sweet Cuban that was in office that, you know, you don't know what you got till it's gone. Yeah. And now I think more than ever, you have to start activating yourselves um, to make the necessary moves that you can get someone like Obama back in yeah. office. You can get someone that you believe in that registers with your values. Or you can run. I mean, or you that's can the run. Thing. That is the, the, the coolest thing about all this. I mean, I'm like, I'm sort of the annoying op I'm very optimistic about everything and people kind of hate so that. Annoying. It's very <laughs> annoying to be optimistic, especially in this day and age where people are so angry. I'm like, Cynic it's gonna be okay. And they're yeah. like, fuck you, man. Like yeah. go away. Cynicism is king right Cynicism now. Cynicism is king. But um no, like there's record number of people running for office, particularly women. It's like a record number of women running for office. And I don't mean like a 100% increase, like 400% increase wow. of women running for office at all levels, like local office, federal office. So I think, I mean, what ended up happening was people were like, how the hell is that guy president? Yeah. They started thinking about their own lives. Like my sister-in-law is running and she just won. My sister-in-law is a doctor. Sister That's I know. Amazing. She lives in Philly and she ran for office, local office in Philly. And she won. She was just That's like, incredible. fuck it. I'm a doctor. I know what my patients need in terms of policy and healthcare policy. I'm going to run for office. That's incredible. So shout out to Rhea Powell and her winning in Philly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think running for office, and I think that there are, to Grace's point, there are incredible candidates out there. Mm -hmm. So 
we don't need to name drop them here, but like there's another Barack Obama. There's the thing about Barack Obama is when he ran at the time, everyone was like, we need someone new. We need yeah. someone fresh. And then this guy just came out of nowhere. And I think that that will eventually happen. I think we will have someone, someone like a Beto O'Rourke. I didn't want to say it, but say you it said now. it for me. Yeah. Thank you. Someone like Beto or Cory Booker, our Jersey. Oh, I, God, I love me some Cory Booker. Yeah. Cory Booker. I, I think there are people, do your research, inform yeah. yourselves in the things that matter most to you. Um, Brad, this was such a wonderful episode. Thank you so much for making Thanks time. Thanks for having. Thanks for going a little deeper. No, this, this was... is the new uh, trajectory of Not Too Deep, and I'm very excited about it. Um, but you get what every guest gets for making time. Oh my god! For being on the podcast is a very. Um, I'm so excited, actually. It's to a see personalized this. fortune oh cookie goodness. just for you. Um, don't recommend eating it, but it's <laughs> safe. It's safe. <laughs> it's safe. <laughs> it's edible. Oh, no. It's edible. I mean, based I after it. your India story, I don't think it'll cause that much damage. Say, uh, my fortune says you were supposed to get an Emmy for Between Two Ferns, but they're so heavy, and it fell when an intern was bringing it to the stage. So they just acted like you didn't get one. We're sorry. But, yeah, on behalf of the <laughs> Emmys, we'll take the apology. This is, so this is really funny though because. Um, every staffer gets an Oval Office photo uh -huh. at, when they leave. Yeah. And so, and you get to bring your family. So I got to bring my oh, wife so and my great. kids. And we were with the president and we're taking photos. And he like loved the kids. But the entire time, he just wanted to know where his Emmy was. <laughs> he kept back. Like at first, it was like Wait, a joke. He's never seen it. He he didn't get one. He does He's not a producer, so he doesn't right. get one. Oh my and God. so he kept being like, so, uh, I'm going to get one. Right. And I like, I was like laughing and I'm like, yeah, like we'll, we'll like figure it out. Like we'll get you an honorary yeah. one. And then like, we kept talking about the kids again. He's like, yeah, so we're going to get that Emmy for me. Right. And I'm like, Oh my God. So we actually reached out to the Emmy awards and they didn't give him one. What? I know. <laughs> they're very Republican. They're the Emmy very, no, I think that like, I don't know what the rules are, but they're That's just, they stuck so... to the rules and they did wow. not give the president. Wow. An Emmy award. I mean, uh, I get the, get the vote out next Emmys, <laughs> I guess, for a uh, recompense to Barack Obama. Uh, Brad, where can people buy the book? Where can they see everything that you're up to at Funny or Die yeah. if they don't know? Um, Westwingers.com mm -hmm. is where you can get the book or any, I guess, are there bookstores still in America? Supposedly. <laughs> I think you can buy Actually, books they're, uh, in stores. they're making a comeback. They're yeah. making a comeback. Just okay, like cool. polling stations. Polling stations yeah. make a comeback. <laughs> So yeah, um, it's really funny. It's really great. And thank you so much for for having me on to talk about the book. It's super fun. It's a really a very fascinating read. And I mean, I read your chapter, which was so, like I said, very entertaining and unusual, something you wouldn't expect. Very bizarre. Hear. Yeah, very bizarre, <laughs> um, but very cool. So I highly encourage everyone to see that. And then Funny or Die, mm -hmm. for folks that aren't unaware, um, we're doing a bunch of cool stuff. We're doing a campaign with Sikhs. Um, which are a community that is the victim of the of the most hate crimes in the country because wow. they wear a turban. Yeah. And Sikh members are uh they're confused with Muslims. Yeah. They're not Muslim, but people think that they're Muslim. Okay. And unfortunately we have a president who's ostracized Muslims in yeah. this country. And so hate crimes have increased. And so we're doing a, a big campaign with those guys. We're working with Google. Actually, I'm mostly here to try and get you to do a campaign with Funny or Die. Uh, We're trying to get a creator, yeah. funny or die campaign going. So that'll cool. be fun. And yeah, and glam up the midterms, glam up the midterms.com. Awesome. Um, so yeah, and then yeah, and then I'm at, at Brad Jenkins. At on Brad Jenkins, all, all social media platforms. Social media platforms. Um, yeah, guys, please, one, go check out all those wonderful things. Um Go out and vote. Go out and vote. It's like, it's fun. It's fun. Make it fun for yourself. Here's the thing I'll say about voting. Uh-huh. The Instagram photo of the I voted sticker is that's, fucking money. That's literally why I <laughs> did it. It's so good. You I, get so many likes from and that. And you can't fake that. You can't take someone else's no. sticker. That's I, at least blasphemy. I hope not. I hope please don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please do it. Brad, thank you so much again thank for making you, time for us. And we'll see you guys next time on another episode of Not Too Deep. Goodbye. Too deep. Too deep. Too deep. Too deep. Not too, Not deep. too deep with Grace Helbig. Not Too Deep is a production of Grace Helbig Incorporated, producer and directed by Jack Ferry. Producer and editor, Melissa D. Mons. Writing by Diane Kang. Post-production sound by Chris Henry. And an extra special thanks to Flula for the theme music. 